In their minds, the police aren't on a disappearance scene. Immediately, this is a murder scene. We thought, something's up. What? We don't know, but something's up. So there's the boxer's lesion that he has on the right fist, and on the other side, she's got a fractured jaw. This is another disturbing element to worry about. This raises questions, and legitimately so. What happened between those 12 days? What happened once the fireman left? What did she say to him? Sunday, June 29th, 2014, in Nancy, in the Meurthe Moselle department, France. It's 7 p.m. when Malika Malouk goes to the home of her son Hafid and her daughter-in-law Julie Martin. She's bringing back their three-and-a-half-year-old child, who she has been looking after since the evening before. But today, the situation isn't normal. Usually, it's the parents, Hafid Malouk or Julie Martin, who go to pick her up. But this time, she hadn't heard from them. No phone call saying, we're coming to get you, we'll be there at such and such a time. So she was a bit worried as she went to their home, thinking, why haven't I heard from them? As she arrives in the building's foyer, Malika Malouk comes across her son, who seems in a hurry and particularly worried. All he says is that he hasn't heard from Julie Martin. He doesn't know where she is, and he's going to look for her. Then, he leaves his mother standing and goes to look for her. Hafid Malouk's mother immediately understands that something serious must have happened, because Julie Martin would never have left without phoning her daughter, who she is very close to. The relationship she has with her daughter is such that she can't go without any news from her daughter. This isn't unusual, it's unthinkable. It's absolutely not normal that Julie Martin doesn't come to pick her daughter up on that Sunday, or that she doesn't worry about her, doesn't call to say she'll be late, or that something's come up. Her not giving a sign of life, that's not normal at all. Both worried and despaired, the grandmother has no other choice than to turn around. As she doesn't see her son returning, she goes back home with the child, waiting for news on Monday morning. Why has Julie Martin, a 34-year-old mother, suddenly gone missing? Is this a voluntary departure? In that case, for what reason? Has something serious happened to her? Monday, June 30th, 2014, day is dawning on Nancy and Julie Martin still hasn't come home. Her partner is more and more worried and warns all those close to him. In the morning, Hafid Malouk warns Julie Martin's family, notably her father and some friends, saying, I haven't heard from Julie, what's going on? He seems rather worried. He also calls a friend of the couple, who is a policeman, to ask him what he should do. As soon as they are warned, Julie Martin's family gets mobilized and starts searching everywhere. They got in touch with hospitals, made phone calls, went to see the neighbors, friends who live nearby. At the end of the morning, Christopher Martin, Julie's brother, decides to call her workplace, a rehabilitation organization where the young woman works as a nurse. Her head of department, her colleagues are surprised. She had appointments, appointments that she always kept, and this time she isn't there. So sure enough, people wonder. It's the first time that she doesn't come to work without warning, without saying she'll be late, that she's sick. This really worries all of her inner circle, including her professional circle. We thought, something's up. What? We don't know, but something's up. Indeed, despite all the research, Julie Martin remains nowhere to be found. As the hours go by, people grow more and more worried and everybody wonders, what could have happened to this ordinary young mother? It has been now more than 24 hours since Julie Martin gave any sign of life. As her family and friends do all they can to find her, something else comes to trouble them. Hafid Malouk, her partner, also seems to have vanished mysteriously. He doesn't go to work, he gives no sign of life, and above all, he doesn't answer the many phone calls from his own family who are worried. Worried sick, his brother Youssef goes to the couple's home, which he has a key for. 
However, he doesn't manage to open the front door. He notices that the house is locked from the inside with the keys in the lock. So he goes back downstairs and sees that the window of the apartment leading to the balcony on the second floor is open and that the light is on inside. He grows more worried and calls emergency services, thinking that something must have happened inside. He immediately thinks of health problems, fainting fit maybe, and why not suicide? All kinds of hypotheses are considered because this doesn't match with Hafid Maluk's usual behavior towards his family, towards his brother who he's close to. As soon as they reach the location, the firemen enter the apartment via the window on the balcony and the first detail catches their attention. The tap in the kitchen sink is open. There's water running. The floor hasn't been flooded, but it is very wet. Several elements catch their eye without being able to say more at the time. A tagine dish that's broken in the sink. But even more surprising, as one of the firemen shuts the tap in the kitchen sink, he notices clothes with reddish-brown stains on them. He adds that he could smell blood on them. At the same time, the rescue workers hear some noise coming from the bathroom. Visibly, somebody is there. So they call, saying, hello, is anybody there? They think he's sick or there's no answer for some time, quite a long time, two or three minutes. So they decide to force the bathroom door open at that moment. The firemen then discover a very strange scene. A washing machine is spinning. Next to it, there's Hafid Malouk, who's washing his hands. Not in a frenzied manner, but very energetically, according to what some firemen say. The man seems to be in a daze. The firemen notice that Afid Malouk is somewhat stunned, probably due to the lack of sleep, because he says he's been looking for Julie all night. Anyhow, he's certainly a little distraught. This is someone in a state of advanced agitation and who visibly isn't in his usual condition. But that's not all. The firemen also notice that Hafid Malouk is injured. There are many scratches on his left forearm, and his right hand is wrapped in a strange bandage. The rescue workers immediately take care of the man. The firemen see this wound. They tend to it, but we don't know yet that this wound will be important. Highly intrigued by the wounded man's behavior, the firemen decide to contact the Nancy crime squad. Informed of Hafid Malouk's suspicious behavior, but also of the disappearance of his partner the day before, the investigators go there immediately to question him. He answers very vaguely that he doesn't know anything. That when he woke up around midday Sunday, she wasn't there anymore, and that he hadn't heard from her. That's the only information he gives. The police then question him about the last time he saw his partner, notably the Saturday evening. On Saturday evening, Hafid Malouk invited one of his friends, nicknamed Coco, for dinner at his house. They watched a World Cup football match together and played on his PlayStation. The man adds that his partner went to bed early and that he carried on alone with a friend. A particularly drunken night, so much so that when he was about to leave, the famous Coco fell, hit a bag of trash as he wasn't going down the stairs in the communal area. And that's when Hafid also fell and injured himself. Hafid Malouk explains that the two men went back to the apartment to tend to their wounds. Julie Martin, a professional nurse, gave them first aid as they waited for the paramedics. She then went back to bed. As for her partner, once the paramedics arrived, they looked after the guest who was wounded and they took him to the ER. Then Avid Malouk says that he lay down on the couch and fell asleep. He says that he didn't see or hear anything and that he woke up a few hours later, much later, since he says he woke up on Sunday around 1 p.m. And only then did he notice that his partner had vanished from the apartment. Was the young woman infuriated by her partner's attitude, so much so that she deserted the marital home? 
In an attempt to see things clearer, the police search the apartment looking for clues, and very soon they lay hands on important objects. Julie's personal belongings, her bank card, her identity papers, her car keys, all of these things are on the living room table. The investigators find no sign of anything that might imply that she ran away, or that she had any kind of project in mind. However, one crucial piece of evidence remains nowhere to be found, the telephone of the missing person. The investigators hope that its geolocation might lead them to her. An investigation is open for a medium-risk missing person. It has been almost two days since Julie Martin gave any sign of life. As her partner, Hafid Malouk, is still in a state of shock, the police decide to look into the young woman's life, hoping to find clues that might explain her disappearance. Soon, they realize that Julie was very much appreciated by all those close to her. She's devoted. She has natural empathy, meaning that she has lots of friends, lots of contacts. She likes to do favors. She loves helping other people. Her profile is of someone who's very kind and devoted to other people. That's something that's very strong and comes out of all the testimonies. They are all of the same mind. Julie is someone you can depend on. When you're in some trouble, she will help out, that's for sure. But she's also very demanding, because she gives, but she also likes to receive. For the last two years, Julie Martin has been working as a nurse in an organization that helps to rehabilitate people socially. She was very devoted to her job, which she enjoyed doing. Everyone was satisfied. Her patients, the management, her colleagues, everything was going well. This was something she felt strongly about, helping out. Three weeks before she went missing, the young woman joined the services of Youth Protection and Juvenile Justice, a turning point in her career that she'd been waiting for impatiently. She was totally satisfied with her choice because this brought her security. She had a job, turned towards other people, focusing on young people and children. As for her personal life, Julie seemed to be enjoying a trouble-free relationship with Hafid Malouk, whom she met at a party five years earlier. Things went very well and very quickly between the two of them. Their friends described them as passionate and happy. They soon settled down together and decided to start a family. This is a child that was wanted, that wasn't easy to get, if I may say so, for medical reasons. And the two of them, after the birth, were very happy because having this little girl was the materialization of their life project. When she finally managed to become a mom and when her little girl was born, it was a ray of sunshine in her life, in both of their lives, because he was totally delighted too. A blooming mother, a new professional direction that fulfilled her. Nothing in Julie Martin's life can explain her sudden disappearance. On the second day of investigations, the police get the results of the geolocation of the missing woman's cell phone. Unfortunately, on the morning of Sunday, June 29th, her phone pinged on a relay mast near home. Then, after that, nothing. The cell phone didn't ping anywhere. The cell phone was switched off or had no battery. Anyhow, it didn't ping anywhere. This doesn't provide much information, apart from the fact that Julie Martin, maybe, her cell phone, certainly was in the family home at the time when the relay mast picked up the reception. This clue fits with Hafid Malouk's testimony according to which Julie had left the family home that morning. But to go where? For the investigators, the mystery remains. On Tuesday, July 1st, 2014, two days after Julie Martin went missing, the police decide to go back to her home to search the couple's car. 
and the evidence they find there is none too reassuring. There are traces of blood on the car door, inside the vehicle, notably on the gear stick, on the steering wheel. They found traces of soil on the car's floor mats, on the wheels, on the lower body frame of the car. There was also lots of mud and scratches on the bodywork. The presence of blood and soil is even more disturbing since Hafid Malouk only bought the car 48 hours before the young woman went missing. The owner cleaned it, so it arrived free of any past, so to speak, whether it's DNA or mud or signs of accidents. It arrived at their home clean and almost new, and 48 hours later, it's found in the building's parking lot. It's not the same as the one bought on Friday. There are tons of clues that the police will use. Samples are immediately taken from the car. But another clue catches the investigators' attention. As they open the trunk, they find an empty jerry can, which gives out a strong smell of gasoline. This is another disturbing element to worry about. There's soil, blood, a jerry can. This raises questions, and legitimately so. Forty-eight hours after Julie Martin went missing, the investigators wonder more and more about the possible involvement of her partner, Hafid Malouk. They remember that the day after the events, the man was found locked up in his bathroom in a daze with suspicious wounds on his hands. A medical examiner is summoned to examine them. Three specific elements were found. One is a bruise with an edema between the base of one finger and the metacarpal. And then there are dermabrasions, which are small superficial scratches, and especially linear marks, which are signs of cuts on the palm side of the hands. Concerning the edema, Hafid Malouk told the investigators he'd hurt himself falling down the stairs when he was helping his friend Coco after a drunken night. But the expert doesn't find this scenario believable. It isn't a fall lesion that caused this edema on the metacarpal. Typically, these kinds of lesions appear when blows are given, struck on something hard, which can very well be a bone of the face. In the medical jargon, this is the boxer's lesion. Why the boxer's lesion? Because boxers will have this by dint of giving blows, by giving a violent punch. This type of edema can arise. As for the cuts observed on the palms of his hands, Hafid Malouk explains that he got them as he was washing a tagine dish which broke suddenly in the sink. But once again, this version isn't compatible with the medical examiner's observations. Mainly, these lesions will have been caused by a cutting object, more so than on an edge or a broken edge. These are typical defensive wounds or those caused when you try to seize a bladed weapon with bare hands and palm forward. The investigators now have several clues that prove that Hafid Malouk has lied to them but they still need to find what he's keeping from them. To try to find out more about the evening of Saturday, June 28th, the police summoned the witnesses that were at the couple's home, namely Coco, the friend who spent the evening with Hafid Malouk, but also the fireman who came to look after Coco around 4 a.m. after he fell. Coco says, I don't remember the evening very well. I was a bit too drunk. He may have fallen, I'm not sure. Coco's testimony is uncertain because of the inebriated state he was in. He doesn't remember everything in detail. But the testimony of the firemen who stepped in is important because everything was written down. They remember it very well when they are questioned. They say there was only one wounded person, the famous Coco. So the wounds noticed later on the hand must have occurred after the fire department services left on Sunday at 3.30 or 4 a.m. Three days after the mysterious disappearance of Julie Martin, an ordinary 34-year-old mother, the police grow increasingly suspicious of her partner being involved. Indeed, Hafid Malouk has behaved strangely, to say the least, since his partner gave no sign of life and several clues intrigue the investigators. 
Hoping to make the inquiry progress, the investigating judge orders a meticulous search of the couple's apartment. In their minds, the police aren't on a disappearance scene. Immediately, this is a murder scene. At the location, forensic identification specialists search for the slightest piece of evidence and their investigations will soon turn out to be successful. They found reddish marks on a doorstop. They also found a pair of sneakers on the balcony with bloodstains on them, full of mud. So all these elements are sampled, bagged as evidence and will be later analyzed. The experts also take the pieces of the tagine dish and the bloodstained jeans from the kitchen sink, which had caught the firemen's attention when they intervened. These are bagged as evidence to be analyzed. Then the decision is made to go over the apartment with Blue Star. Blue Star is a mixture based on a reactive substance called luminol that allows us to find bloodstains that aren't visible to the naked eye. There are two reasons why we can't see them. One is natural erosion, but in a much more frequent way, it's due to someone else having cleaned the scene. When Blue Star reacts positively to the presence of blood, it gives out a blue fluorescent light in the dark. The apartment is plunged in the dark, and as soon as the product is sprayed... There are traces of blood all over the apartment, except in the little girl's bedroom and the toilets. But there are some in the kitchen, the living room, on the door jams, in the bathroom, and of course in the bedroom. So for the investigators with these Blue Star observations, the explanation is that the apartment has been cleaned. Bloodstains also appear on the headboard of the couple's bed, and these display a very specific shape. When we look at these stains, there are circular stains, ovoid stains. These are all measured in millimeters. That is typical of what we call spatter. This means that an event other than simple gravity occurred, so it isn't mere bleeding. Either there was gesticulation or someone was hit, and it caused the blood to spatter. Samples are taken, hoping to identify who this blood belongs to. But it is obvious that the apartment was a stage to a violent scene, and the investigators know this. With this discovery, the chances of finding Julie Martin alive grow thin. All these elements led them to reckon that there may have been a fight with Julie Martin. Bloodshed, maybe even worse. The rest of the investigations only further confirm this hypothesis, for in the parking lot of the building where the couple's car is parked, the Blue Star reacts once again. There is blood in the basement leading to the vehicle. There are bloodstains in the car, which had already been seen to the naked eye, on the gear stick notably and on the steering wheel. The Blue Star reveals that on the mat in the trunk, there's a huge pool of blood. No need to be Sherlock Holmes to think. Perhaps something happened in the home. Then you follow the blood and go out to the parking lot, up to the car. So indeed, once again, the scenario that emerges is given by the evidence. After this search, Nancy's public prosecutor's department opens an investigation into murder. For the investigators, Hafid Malouk now stands as the number one suspect. The investigators try to understand what could have encouraged Hafid Malouk, loving partner and good father, to lash out on Julie Martin. They decide to question those close to Julie Martin once again, and they soon realize that behind the quiet appearances, the relationship within the couple was actually very complicated. When you take a closer look at this global picture and try to look behind the surface, you do notice certain dissonant notes, notably moments before Julie Martin went missing. A particularly difficult financial situation seemed to be the cause. When we wanted to plan a meal at a restaurant, it was always difficult, if not negative, because financially it wasn't possible. And the fact that he bought a car 48 hours before the tragedy couldn't have soothed the relationship. Because with him investing money in this car, she can't have been happy to see this car. 
He works without really working. He had temporary contracts. What's revealing is that when a contract ended, he didn't look for work immediately. He waited until the last minute to enjoy a bit of quiet time, to let himself go with the flow, live a little, before looking for a new job. And gradually, considering the financial issues the couple experienced, she must have reproached him for not being involved enough and not supporting the family on a material level. But other than her partner's lack of activity, Julie Martin reproached him of being slack, even completely idle, which he justified in a deceptive way. She reproached him of being slightly hypochondriac. He always complained, was always sick, and so on. He did get sick. I think it was the chicken pox that he got very late. He always blamed this illness for all sorts of symptoms and after effects, which he complained about regularly, saying, I've got a headache. I'm not well. I don't feel good. In other words, Hafid Malouk always had a good excuse to not do anything and let his partner deal with the entire organization of their everyday life. When he didn't work, she would get up one hour earlier in the morning, at 6 a.m., to look after the little one, take her to the childcare center or her family, then go to work. He lived his life and enjoyed lying in bed in the morning. An episode related to the investigators by Julie's best friend illustrates the state of exhaustion the woman was in the day before she went missing. On Saturday the 28th, they went for a walk in a park nearby and Julie Martin told him how tired she was. She even fell asleep on the grass, which wasn't usual for her, when her daughter was playing nearby. She was really exhausted physically, but also on a psychological level. This situation was difficult to bear and she couldn't see a favorable outcome to it. Her daily life had become so unbearable that the young woman even considered turning a new leaf. Julie Martin may have wanted to take a break, maybe not split up with Hafid Malouk, but at least take a break for a while. Did Julie warn her partner of her separation projects, causing a violent crisis in him, even a murderous one? For the investigators, this lead is entirely believable and deserves to be followed. At this point in the investigation, the police still don't have enough tangible proof to incriminate Hafid Malouk. They decide to go through his telephone records. This analysis will soon turn out to be successful because it provides an essential clue concerning the famous night between Saturday and Sunday just after the firemen left. From 4, 4.35 a.m., his cell phone stops working. It's completely switched off until the next day, shortly before midday. Questioned about this, Hafid Malouk tells the investigators that his cell phone suddenly broke down that night. The geolocation of his cell phone is also ordered, but unfortunately, it doesn't provide any essential information. During 24 hours, the phone records don't show anything. There is no lead to follow that could incriminate him. Similarly, the phone records don't reveal where Julie Martin is. We still don't know where she can be. Her phone is off. It doesn't give out any signal. And so the police have no clues. But another detail catches the investigator's attention concerning the suspect's phone calls after his partner went missing. Although he says he's looking for her all over the place, in an active way, he only tries to call her three times, which sounds off for the partner of a missing person. When you're worried and you're looking for someone, you don't call them three times. On Monday morning, between 10 a.m. and midday, I must have called her 30 times, and she's not my partner. There's a discrepancy between what others would do and what he did. But that's not all. In Hafid Malouk's cell phone, the investigators also find a strange message he sent on Monday morning. He sent a text message at 5 o'clock in the morning to his sister, saying everything is okay, Julie is at a friend's house. Why reassure her when he says he's very worried about this disappearance? Is he trying to buy time? By telling the family, I found her, don't worry. This text message is an odd one. The investigators also look through the cell phone exchanges between the couple. 
That is how they find the last text sent by Julie Martin to her partner. The message goes back 12 days before she disappeared, and it speaks for itself. I'm not in the same state of mind as you are. I have many projects that don't appeal to you, and I'm in despair. It's going to be hard for me, but once I've turned a new leaf, I won't come back. I will go forward. With this message, the investigators have the confirmation that Julie Martin was about to start a new life without her partner. We are beginning to see an explanation for what could have triggered a violent scene. The fact that Julie certainly announced that she was going to leave. Leaving to leave him or leaving to take a break, I don't know. But this could explain a violent reaction at that moment. More than ever, the police are now convinced that the conflict within the couple got out of control that mysterious Saturday evening. What happened between those 12 days and June 29th, 30th? What happened once the fireman left? What did she say to him? The only person who knows is Hafid, since he was there and he's the last one to have seen her alive. With these new pieces of evidence, the investigators decide to place Hafid Malouk in custody. They hope that by confronting him with all these elements incriminating him, they will get answers to their questions. Ten days after his partner has gone missing, Hafid Malouk faces the police who suspect him, but he behaves strangely, to say the least. While he's in custody, his partner is still missing, but he isn't particularly concerned. He doesn't ask any questions to the police, he doesn't try to help them look for her, although for him, she's still alive and she's missing. No, he centers on his own little problems, on the conditions of his custody, material elements linked to him, wanting a coffee and so on, utterly ludicrous things. The investigators start by questioning their suspect about the famous evening of June 28th. His attitude remains constant. He refuses to answer questions. He doesn't say anything, and when he does accept to give an element or an answer, it's always the same one, being, I've got nothing to do with this. I simply cleaned the apartment after the evening, and then I fell asleep. I'm not responsible. I didn't witness anything. I haven't done anything. I didn't see anything. Hafid Malouk does give a possible explanation as to the disappearance of his partner. While he's in custody, he mentions the possibility of her making an unfortunate encounter. Through her job as a nurse in a rehabilitation organization with people who are on the margins, who can be drunk and slightly difficult, he suggests the hypothesis that one of those people may have been obsessed with her and she may have made a bad run. She came across him by chance or fell into a trap that Sunday morning. But this scenario doesn't fit with the different incriminating clues accumulated by the police during their inquiry, starting with the mud found on a pair of sneakers and in the suspect's car. Once again, he says, I went for a walk with the dog in a park nearby. It might come from there. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't have an explanation to give you. In regards to the blood-stained jeans found in the kitchen sink, the man is no more specific here either. I cleaned up, I took what I found, that must be why. There might be some blood because I hurt myself too. These explanations are very vague, very inconsistent. They don't convince anybody. That is how, after his custody, despite his constant denial, Hafid Malouk is placed under formal investigation for murder and immediately imprisoned. In the policeman's mind, it's clear. He killed her. It's perfectly clear that he killed her. We don't know where the body is. We don't know how he killed her. But he killed her. After 10 days of investigation, the police are convinced that they have the culprit, but he still hasn't confessed. They rely on the results of the DNA analysis to prove that Hafid Malouk killed Julie Martin. But against all the odds, the blood found in many places is Hafid Malouk's. Whether it's in the apartment or in the garage, in the basement. On the jeans found in the sink, the blood also belongs to Hafid Malouk. 
However, concerning the traces revealed by the blue star in the bathroom and on the bedroom wall, the blood found on the spatter in the parents' room is definitely Julie Martin's. The young woman bled profusely in this room. This is an essential clue for the investigators. Now they have something that is beginning to look like a real crime scene, even if there's no body at that time. But that's not all. Other elements that had been bagged as evidence, such as the pair of sneakers belonging to Hafid Malouk displaying bloodstains and mud, highlighted a mixture of DNA belonging to Hafid Malouk and Julie Martin. But it's especially the results of the DNA samples taken in the trunk of the couple's car that will turn out to be incriminating. The huge bloodstain found on the mat in the trunk of the car is Julie Martin's blood. And the investigators know this. Hafid Malouk only bought this car 48 hours before his partner went missing. She didn't like this car. She was against buying it. She didn't go near it. She didn't go inside it. How come her blood is found inside the car? Not on the passenger seat. Not at the front. Not on the dashboard. But in the trunk. In the trunk? What was she doing in the trunk? Why did she bleed in the trunk? How can you explain that? Well, he doesn't explain that. Similarly, Hafid Malouk provides no explanation for the presence of blood spatter in the bedroom. However, concerning the stains found in the bathroom, the man has an answer, but it turns out to be an extravagant one, to say the least. This blood would be linked to her having a very heavy period. That's how he explained the blood stains. As such, although the investigators make the suspect face all the evidence pointing against him, the man continues to deny any involvement in his partner's disappearance and provides utterly unlikely answers. The reaction of the investigators after these declarations is skepticism. None of the explanations he gives seem plausible at all. Tuesday, July 14, 2014, Julie Martin has been missing for almost two weeks. As the police continue to interrogate her partner, Hafid Malouk, they suddenly get a phone call that makes the investigation leap forward. A man has just found human remains in the forest of Clairlieu. This forest is very close to Nancy. It's very accessible. It's a place that's very popular with many walkers, especially during that season. The investigators go there immediately. They find the remains of a pyre containing parts of a human body that are extremely degraded. They will find the cephalic extremity, so a head that hasn't been entirely destroyed, fragments of the body, the chest, and so on. But this is a body that has been burned in an attempt to get rid of it. They suspect this to be a criminal case. This person was killed or at least their body was burned, and they tried, while waiting to identify it, to connect it with recent missing persons. There weren't 50 different people who went missing in Nancy in the days before that, so this is quickly connected to the disappearance of Julie Martin. While waiting for a formal identification of the corpse, a medical examiner is summoned to perform the transportation of the body, a particularly sensitive operation. This is in a natural environment, so they must collect a maximum of traces and clues. Let's not forget that although the chest and head remain, the bones have been weakened tremendously. There are false fractures due to the fire, and the bone tissues have been degraded. So they must be extremely careful when lifting the body and gathering all the elements of the body to be placed in a bag. This is a highly sensitive operation. Once the body has been evacuated, the experts sift through the remains of the pyre meticulously. They sift through the remains to try to remove external elements such as leaves that fell, burnt pieces of wood, and maybe elements of identification. A jewel that burned, a tooth that might provide precise information. This operation reveals essential clues. A burnt telephone, but also broken crockery, which particularly intrigues the investigators.
What surprises everyone is finding a phone, why not? But the pieces of ceramic, a broken dish in a pyre, that doesn't seem very natural. It's even more striking since it seems to match with another tagine dish that was present in the apartment of the couple, Julie and Hafid. As these clues are bagged as evidence to be analyzed, the burned body is taken to the Nancy mortuary to be autopsied. On Tuesday, July 14, 2014, the remains of a body have been found in a forest in Nancy. Is this Julie Martin, a 34-year-old mother who mysteriously disappeared two weeks earlier? That's the first question the emergency autopsy must answer. The medical examiner starts by extracting DNA from a bone of the corpse. This sample is immediately compared with the DNA fingerprint of the missing woman collected on her toothbrush. The results are clear and put an end to two weeks of uncertainty for the young woman's family. The feeling is, we found her. I'd come around to the idea that she wouldn't be found in a... How can I put it? Decent way? I wasn't shocked. I wasn't surprised. I was relieved. Even if that may seem inappropriate. And on the other hand, there's a part of me that doesn't want it to be like that. The medical examiner tries to identify the causes of death. To do so, he examines the bones to see whether they present any particular lesions. But seeing the carbonized state of the body, the analysis turns out to be quite complicated. There are lesions that are difficult to read into in this type of case. Lesions caused by wounds, probably, but that could also have been caused by the heat. And there are fracture lesions which, once again, raise the question between a fracture lesion and a lesion caused by the fire. However, the victim's skull presents a specific lesion that leaves very little room for doubt. There's a so-called starburst fracture, meaning it has a point of impact, a bit like when you have a chip on a windscreen with a crack and lines that are prolonged. This implies a lesion that occurred when the person was alive, caused by a blunt object. This clue seems to be the sign of a wound caused during an attack, but that's not all. And the mandible here is fractured with a fracture line to the left. Typically, one of the lesions may have been caused by a blow to the face, not to the skull, not to the top part of the head. And this is characteristic of a lesion that occurred when the person was alive. The investigators immediately connect this to the wounds noticed on Hafid Malouk's right hand. So there's the boxer's lesion that he has on the right fist and on the other side. She's got a fractured jaw. Nevertheless, these clues cannot determine the exact causes of Julie Martin's death. The suspect is then immediately summoned by the investigating judge who informs him that his partner's body has been found. His attitude is very surprising. He doesn't collapse. Simply puts his hands over his ears and refuses to hear what they are telling him. He should, like Julie's family was, be disturbed, but relieved to know what happened if he wasn't involved in this case. The man is then questioned about the place where Julie Martin's body was found. Hafid Malouk gives another surprising answer. He says he doesn't know this forest when everybody knows it. As for his wounded fist, he continues to claim that it was caused when he fell down the stairs. But as the number one suspect continues to claim he's innocent, new evidence comes to make the inquiry shift. Six months later, faced with Hafid Malouk's denial, the investigating judge decides to request a new series of analyses. The first one concerns essential clues the pieces of crockery found near Julie Martin's burnt corpse. They will compare them with the pieces of tagine dish found in the sink at the couple's home. The first question is, could this be the same dish 
Et après, effectivement, ce And also, could this dish have been used to kill Julie Martin? And if not, could it have been used as a projectile against her? The idea is really to try to connect and find a link between what was found in the apartment and what is found on the pyre. Because if it is the same dish, it means that Afid Malouk killed Julie Martin. To carry out this comparison, an expert examines the chemical composition of the pieces from both dishes, and after analyzing them, it corresponds more or less to the same series or the same type of dish of industrial origins. However, the elements collected on one side and the other cannot help the experts say whether this dish served as a crime weapon to kill Julie Martin or not. But another clue remains, the soil found under Hafid Malouk's sneakers and on the tires of his car. They collected soil samples from the edge of the forest up to the pyre. The goal is to see whether this soil shows similarities, and if it doesn't, whether it comes from a different area. And once again, when the expert compares the samples, the soils are compatible. So it's the same soil, the same composition, found under Hafid Malouk's sneakers, under his car wheels, and it's the same that leads up to the pyre in the forest. So, obviously, Hafid Malouk went near this pyre. It isn't incriminating proof that proves by A plus B that he killed her, but it is a small grain laid on the track leading to Hafid Malouk. Two years after Julie Martin's mysterious death, no new element has allowed to make this inquiry progress. But on August 18, 2016, before closing the case, the judge orders one last analysis. Without Hafid Malouk's confession, the investigating judge hopes that this examination will shed some light on the criminal scenario. We will try to understand, we will try to understand what happened within the apartment and in the bedroom, which is visibly the crime scene. So this is where the bloodstain pattern analysis comes into play, reenacting the violent scene that led to Julie Martin's death. Expert Philippe Esperanza is in charge of analyzing these stains. He starts by examining the blood spatter that was found in the couple's bedroom on the bed's headboard. We see that the convergence is at the bed level, so the victim was on the bed when she was hit, which projected the blood. Next, we look at how the blood is spread on the wall, and we see that it is a bit like a sun, homogeneous. There is as much to the left as to the right. That's typical of a blow given from an almost perpendicular position to the surface we're looking at which allows us to position the attacker facing the wall. In other words, Hafid Malouk probably struck his partner when she was lying in bed and he was kneeling on top of her. The expert then analyzes the important blood stain found in the trunk of the car. The stain is homogeneous. There is a line that draws the outline, and the inside of that is totally homogeneous. This means that something was placed there and that it didn't move. The bloodstain pattern analysis allowed to reenact the scene approximately. There was an extremely violent scene in the bedroom, with one or several blows given in a significantly strong way for blood to splatter all over the place. Then the body was moved. The body started to bleed because it must have been hemorrhaging. That's why they found a lot of blood in the apartment, right down into the basement, the garage, and even more in the trunk of the car where the body lay. The bloodstain pattern analysis confirms that on the night of June 28, 2014, Julie Martin was killed at home. Her body was then transported in Hafid Malouk's car. And although he continues to deny being involved, he is tried for murder at Nancy Circuit Court. Years after the tragedy, Julie Maldon's family remains deeply marked by these horrific events. But to their sorrow, deep frustration is added from not knowing what really happened that evening. 
There is the difficulty of living after such a tragedy in itself, which was strengthened by the fact that there is no rational explanation or any cooperation from Hafid Malouk. What they would have liked to know is what happened. They would have liked him to give at least some explanation, even a partial one, about what triggered such extreme violence. Why did he go to burn the body afterwards? Although we can imagine this. So for them, the difficulty grew stronger over time. Julie Martin leaves behind her 10-year-old little girl who is gradually getting back on track. As for her brother, he is now seeking recovery, but the trauma is undeniably deeply rooted. It destroyed us greatly. And we try to focus on the future. For us, for our children, because we have great things to live. Of course, we don't forget her. She's here, she's present. Not a day goes by without me thinking of her. I think of her as in, what did she go through? I'm stuck on that weekend of June 29th, 30th.